Welcome to today's session of Open Texas 2022. I'm Lisa Lewis with the Open Texas Conference Committee. I'll be emceeing this session. Thank you all for joining us today for, um, oh, sorry. I have the incorrect information in my guide, sorry. Equal Partners, Expectations, Milestones, and Division of Labor in UT Austin's Open Education Fellows Program. And I'll give it to the presenters to take it away. Thank you so much for the welcome, Lisa. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here with us. I hope you had a nice lunchtime break and enjoyed this morning's uh, keynote session and other sessions. My name is Ashley Morrison. I am the Talker Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. My responsibility in this role is to drive the awareness and adoption of OER and other types of free and affordable course materials across campus. And I coordinate and facilitate a number of programs to help do that. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, I am joined by two of my fabulous faculty colleagues and inaugural Open Education Fellows, and I'll let them each introduce themselves. I guess we have to decide who goes first. <laughs> Diane, would you like to go? <laughs> I can go. Hi, my name is Diane Rhodes, and I'm a senior lecturer in the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. I have uh, been in that role for 10-ish years coming up on, um, but I had a, a full career as a social worker before I came back and got my PhD. <laughs> so, and one of the things I found is that I'm really interested in pedagogy and new learning technology for students. And that was something that led me in this direction. Josh? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Diane. I'm uh, Joshua Frank or Josh Frank. I go by Josh, typically assistant professor of instruction in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Um, my, my background, my, my PhD is in Hispanic linguistics uh, and second language acquisition or heritage language acquisition. Um, what really got me interested in this uh, sort of business in the Hispanic world, which is the theme of the, the resource that I'll be sharing today, is my background and spending several years in, in industry, actually in, in language coaching. Um, and so sort of I combined the two things um, in, this, in this opportunity. We can talk about that a little bit later. So thanks. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for introducing yourselves. We have the next 45 minutes or so to spend together now. And what we're going to do is take you through a little bit about the Open Education Fellows Program. We'll talk about the background and why we started doing this. Uh, I am most excited to have you hear from Diane and Josh about their experiences as fellows, the work that they've done as part of the fellowship, and also some of the support that they've received from the libraries and other partners around campus to help meet their objectives. We'll close out with some of the insights that I've had as the program coordinator. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, we're planning to handle questions at the end, but you are very welcome to drop any questions that you have as they occur to you in chat. Um, and we will be sure to come back to them at that time. Um, but let me get us started. So a bit of background. UT Libraries launched the Open Education Fellows pilot in calendar year 2022, so this year, uh, to offer UT Austin faculty a combination of programming and financial support that would facilitate the adoption or development of OER. Uh, prior to the fellows program, we'd never really offered a structured incentive like the grants or awards that many of our peer institutions already offered. Um, I'm imagining many of you in this room do. Uh, with the benefit of observing so many models and hearing feedback from colleagues on what seemed to work well and what they'd already learned, we shaped a program with requirements that we hoped would influence the specific outcomes we wanted to see. Namely, this was to reduce the cost of required course materials for UT students, to empower our instructors to meet their pedagogical goals with the right course materials, and hopefully to foster a real community of OER users and creators on our campus. Given our goals and successful program models that we consulted, we developed a list of fellows requirements and expectations that were reiterated in the application process and before fellows officially accepted their award. We asked that fellows commit to using the OER that they adopted or created for at least two semesters that they report their adoption to our campus bookstore each semester in compliance with Senate Bill 810 and House Bill 1027, 
that they attend some required professional development sessions that I'll elaborate on later, that they're okay with being featured in media in connection with the fellows program and hopefully join us for some campus events to support it in the future, that they would license any materials created in the scope of the program with approved Creative Commons licenses and share them in a repository, and that they assess the impact of OER adoption via student perceptions or outcomes data. Now that is a really long list of requirements in the scope of a one-year program, and we wanted to make sure that fellows would have the support that they needed to be successful, which takes us to what we offered in return to fellows. For the financial aspect of the program, we evaluated the award amounts offered in similar programs at other institutions. Because we felt we were asking for a lot more than just adoption or creation of OER, we did our best to offer a competitive amount that generally benchmarks on the high end of comparable, pro comparable programs, though, of course, we would like to offer more if that budget existed. Uh, for adoption fellows to find and adopt existing OER, we provide $2,000 stipends upon completion of all program requirements. And for some context that you may know or may not, we found that this activity is most commonly awarded anywhere between $500 and $1,500 in examples that we looked at. And for our author fellows, we offer $5,000 stipends divided into two half payments, the first at roughly the midway point of the program and the last upon completion of all requirements. And in the case of team-based projects like Josh's, the stipend amounts are divided among the applicant team. But beyond financial support, which is obviously really important, we also wanted to offer programming, consultation, and sometimes hands-on support that helps each fellow meet their goal. And part of the value we hoped we could add is in developing a cohort that would allow fellows to work as closely as they like with colleagues who are likely outside of their departments or disciplines, but hold similar values and objectives. As such, the program offers a balance of workshops and discussions that are hosted for the full cohort, as well as individual check-ins and consultations throughout the fellowship. And we make a variety of consultations available, some with librarians on topics like licensing, copyright, and assessment, um, as well as campus partners who can consult on developing accessible course materials and more. And those consultations, check-ins, and programming opportunities are reflected here on the program calendar that we shared with fellows. And what you're seeing is actually a second or third version because we solicited fellows feedback on the proposed calendar and topics. And we ended up rearranging some sessions and moving up check-in times in response to their suggestions and needs. We offered workshops and discussion sessions on topics that we hoped would help them complete their objectives and also hopefully enrich the experience, even if it wasn't critical to those objectives. So we made only a small number of those workshops required, including the cohort kickoff meeting and open licensing overview. Attendance was optional at almost all of the other sessions covering open pedagogy, accessibility, OER project assessment, and culturally, culturally responsive course materials. Um, despite that, that it was optional, almost all of those sessions were attended by at least five of six fellows. We also received really positive feedback on the usefulness of the content covered in those through the anonymous survey that we deployed to fellows at the end of the spring semester. So based on that, we hope to keep them all in future offerings of the fellows program, though we do want to find ways to make them more interactive, even if they have to stay on Zoom per participant feedback that we heard loud and clear. Some fellows also availed themselves of the consultations that we made available with librarians and other staff, including copyright and accessibility consultations. And I personally sat in on each of those to learn and observe, and I found them really valuable, even if they didn't have a high uptake among fellows. So I imagine that that's something that we'll keep as part of the program as well. So that was a little about the program as it was envisioned and designed, but I wanna stop there so we can all learn what it was like to actually participate in the program as a fellow. So I'm happy now to turn things over to Diane, one of our three adoption fellows to share her experience. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that she can take over. Thank you, Ashley. It doesn't seem, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at all of that and it's like, wow, was that just now? <laughs> You know, and it was so much fun to do all of that. So let me share my screen 
and talk a little bit about my experience both before and during um, the fellowship experience. Um, so my first introduction to thinking about OER in an organized way was really when um, Ashley was doing a presentation at a different meeting that I was at. And it piqued my curiosity. I was immediately interested and wanted to explore a bunch of um, anything I could get my hands on. I think I probably emailed Ashley like while she was presenting to us in that, in that presentation. I was like, hey, help, I want to do this. Um, and it really felt like the beginning of what has been a very, very rich journey for me, but also for our school. Um, so I considered authoring something and that seemed like oh, such a big task. And you will hear from Josh what a huge undertaking that might be. Maybe not, it would be for me. Um, but in working with Ashley prior to the fellowship, one of the things that I learned was that social work isn't really well represented um, in existing OER when it comes to teaching social work skills. And that's what I teach. Like if I wanted to teach about history, if I wanted to teach about services, there were things that I could use. But that's not what I teach. I teach social work skills, basic skills. And so I think there's a rich place there for um, contribution, and, and I'm looking forward to getting more into that. So the fellowship program, when it came along, really offered guidance, as you can see from the outline of that program, help in selecting, implementing OER. And the thing that was really most helpful for me was a timeline. I do better with deadlines and people pushing me around to do things than just like, oh, I'd like to adopt an OER. And that could be a pipe dream forever. So <laughs> the fellowship was super helpful in terms of making it actually happen. Um, the opportunities to meet and learn from the librarians and from my colleagues was absolutely the most invaluable part of the process. Um, I met librarians that I wouldn't have met. I was familiar with our subject librarian and with our OER librarian, but I had not met some of the others that I was fortunate enough to meet. And so that was really wonderful too. Um, let me see if I can advance this. Here we go. The course that I was adopting for is called Social Work in Organizations and Communities. And it's an extremely hands-on class where our social work students who are primarily upperclassmen are actually going to go into a community and implement a program. And I had never been able to find a textbook that was suitable for what I wanted them to do and that was active enough for what I wanted them to do. And so let me talk a little bit about the librarian support before I get too deep into the OER. Um, Ashley has been incredible support. I really, I truly cannot imagine how long it would have taken me to do this. <laughs> Um, she was able to help me find social work resources that do exist. <laughs> she was able to offer me access to openly licensed image search resources that feature BIPOC and folks with disability. And that was incredibly important to me. <laughs> but I think really the hugest thing that she was able to do is to help me understand that I was already using some open educational resources and just didn't know it. <laughs> And so I wasn't fully taking advantage of them. You know, she would say, but that is an open education resource. I was like, what? I don't understand. <laughs> and that, that was really amazing. Um, so the experience was seeing a resource that I was already using, which is a website that was developed at, the, at Kansas University. And um, it is a huge resource called the Community Toolbox. The site is massive. And in the past, I had used the resource just as a reference to tell students, as you're doing this project, check with the community toolbox, or here's a lesson from the community toolbox that we might use. It had never really crossed my mind to structure the class around the content of the toolbox and actually use it as the textbook for the class. And so we had to take our lesson plans and really look to find the most effective pages on the site because undergraduates, you know, I don't know if, if, if this is true for everyone, but at least in my world, undergraduates don't do, don't read. <laughs> they know how to read. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying that they can't, but they don't. <laughs> and so overwhelming them with this huge website was not going to be very effective. So kind of paring it down and finding what needed to work for each lesson was an important part of it. And then figuring out how to provide the links in our LMS and both in the syllabus so that they most of our students in the School of Social Work are accustomed to having a hard 
that textbook. And so getting them accustomed to following a link or using something more digital was also a part of that process. My TA and I also did a lot of searching on TED and on YouTube for video that would engage that same material that was available on the website. Because again, with them not reading, they like to listen and see and do the thing. <laughs> and we gave them extra points for doing their reading by creating quizzes based on the content purely on the reading content, they could easily get a couple of extra points by taking that quiz and showing that they had read the pages um, and watched the video. Um, the students' response to the OER was wonderful. They enjoyed it much more than they have enjoyed textbooks in the past. I got far fewer questions from folks about what am I supposed to be doing or why are we reading this or who wrote this or why is this so out of date? <laughs> and in the field of social work, that is a huge problem with traditional textbooks. By the time they have gotten published, the world has changed. A pandemic has happened or a flood has come, an election has happened, and the world looks very different than it did when the authors wrote the book. <laughs> the folks in Kansas keep up on their website with all of those things. And the students were able to find things that were very um, applicable to the communities that they were working in. It was wonderful. They really appreciated having a course where there was no additional cost. Um, associated with buying materials for the class, but they also liked the thoroughness of the toolbox. They loved how expert it was. Each page in that toolbox is written by experts in the field. It's been so well curated and the size of it, while first overwhelming for them, became something that they were more comfortable working with. And when I talk about the impact or think about the impact of um, this exploratory program that I plan to be doing forever now. <laughs> I have loved exploring OER resources. I have loved going to OER workshops and learning more about um, making uh, open educational resources available to my students. Um, most of my students are very interested in working with populations of folks who have been impacted by poverty or are really struggling. And so they're also looking for things that are low cost that they can pass on to their future clients. It fits very well with the philosophy of social work to try and find resources that are open to everyone um, and easily accessible. I'm going to be really honest and say that it took some convincing with my colleagues. <laughs> which is why I have this picture of someone looking so skeptical. When I talked about what I was doing, there was kind of, from my colleagues who have written textbooks, seemed almost offended that that was a choice that I would make. Um, I had to be politically careful in that arena, but also people wanted to know about expertise. Like how could you do something that's free? Obviously it's not gonna be expert. Like, where did you find this thing? Why are you doing this? And so it did take a lot of show and tell to bring my colleagues along. But what I will say, and the thing that I'm probably most proud of from this entire experience is that the Steve Hicks School of Social Work for this particular course is now using this OER as the standard textbook across our department. <laughs> All of the other folks who teach this class loved it. Their skepticism got allayed. <laughs> they saw the toolbox. They were super, super excited. Um, the other thing, which is about impact, is that many of my students said that they were going to be able to refer to the toolbox forever, that as they went out as professional social workers, which they are looking at doing in about a year, that now they know that there's this resource for them that they can go to and look at for approaching communities in the future and doing what they need to do. And I love that. That's really at the heart of teaching social work. It's definitely a boots on the ground kind of profession. And we want folks to be able to take things that they're going to be able to refer to over and over again in their careers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Josh and let him tell you about the authoring experience. <laughs> and I will stop my share. Thanks, Diane, and Ashley's sharing the, the slides here that I'll just refer to. And yeah, I would say in, in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, it's, it's similar um, when you publish resources, the, the notion that is it still relevant? Um, and as specifically as you get to more applied areas like business Spanish or medical Spanish, um, 
the, the topics, the themes, the way you present them really do change. There's all these cultural components. Um, so I can definitely relate to that. And, and that's a, a definite benefit of OER, of open resources. Okay. Um, so let me just jump really quickly and give a quick overview of the author fellow experience that I had with my team. Uh, my team is composed of me, Josh Frank, Mina Oganda, and Delia Montesinos, um, who were more senior to me in the department, uh, are still more senior to me in the department, um, had so many resources at their disposal over just the work they've done throughout the years. And when I came, I came from a space of having worked in industry, and then I wanted to apply that experience to my PhD. And so I wanted to be involved in the sort of the last course in line for the, biz, for the Spanish certificate, which is either medical Spanish or business Spanish. So for me, the obvious choice was, was business. Um, and Mina and Delia were so generous in the resources they shared with me um, and the connections they had in Mexico and Spain. And so that was sort of the, the impetus to all of this. And so I'll get into that in some more detail. And I also wanted to just give a little bit of an overview as to why we applied, um, what the resource is and what the development process looked like, um, our collaboration, which, you know, the, the expression, it takes a village really does come to mind. And, and I guess, forgive my idioms, I guess it's just sort of the, the bilingual issue that I have with idioms, but um, what comes to mind is just how different skill sets, how many different skill sets were brought into the, to the room throughout the, the year that just made this a really synergistic experience. Um, some challenges along the way, and I'll tap into actually the title of this entire um, presentation to talk about some of the challenges. And then uh, the student reception responses that will continue, we'll continue to click data on that. So if you don't mind just going to the next slide, I'll jump right into it. Um, so why we applied, uh, there's probably any number of ways of categorizing this or any number of ways of discussing this, but I sort of thought about two initial categories. I was involved um, in an OER instructor learning community beforehand, just the semester before, and that really raised my awareness. I didn't have a, a, a vast knowledge of open resources or a, a lot of experience using them in the past, um, but I came in with this sort of naive background into this learning community led by Ashley and UTL as well at University of Texas Libraries. And I quickly just saw the value of it, the beauty of it, the, the relevance to students, um, the financial benefits, and I, as Diane mentioned, the, the ways that it can continue to be updated easily and quickly, these resources to be relevant for students. Um, so I went from student to advocate or mentor and wanting others to learn about this in our department and others had already known much more than me anyway in our department um, very quickly. Um, and then, of course, I think as part of that community, there was this recruitment from within the group as well. To There's another opportunity coming up if you want to sort of build on the level up on the skills that we've talked about. Here's a great opportunity. So I applied. We applied. Um, and then the reason we applied as it pertains to the content uh, of the course and, and my department and my team was just a gap in existing resources. Um, we had a lot of informal supplemental resources that we could use, but we this course that's titled um, Business in Hispanic Life and Culture um, has a cultural flag, um, really wants to emphasize leadership and the language components of that, like the multicultural experience, not just bicultural, not just bilingual, um, and how that pertains to when you're a manager. And, and that was part of my background, too, in industry. Um, and, and then, of course, we have our curriculum, uh, our beginning Spanish levels, and it's hard to find a textbook that really builds on the curriculum within your department. Sure, there are general um, grammatical pieces like the subjunctive or the tenses and things like of, of that nature, but to really build it on our previous courses that requires some customization. Um, and then uh, we really wanted this to be more applied than the content that is out there and really have a whole chapter on or a whole series on professional development. Like you might have a CV, you might have, or let's call it a resume, right? Uh, we're, not in, we're not all in academia after we graduate. Um, you might have a, a resume, but is it in Spanish? Um, you're a bilingual professional or will soon be one, um, having the resources, having knowing how to write a cover letter, but in other languages will be tremendously valuable. So those are a couple of reasons why uh, we applied. 
let me, uh, <laughs> let me just move on here. Um, really, really quickly, as I'm gathering, I'm not going too quickly. Um, the, the resource business in Hispanic life and culture that we wanted to develop um, and that had already started resource development with Mina and Delia um, sort of had four initial sections that pertain to first, you know, entrepreneurship and different types of business from small micro businesses to larger corporate businesses, the structure of them, um, examples, and not just examples in the US, but all around the world and with reference to the Spanish speaking world with reference even specifically to Mexico and Spain where we had direct connections through Mina and Delia. Then of course this notion from of, a, of an applied chapter whether it's you're you're going to have an interview coming up so what are the resources that you develop to get to that stage and what is it going to look like after you get the job and how can you even search for a job. Um, so we wanted to do that and we wanted to do it in Spanish. Sometimes it's it's no more complicated than let's really use these general skill sets, but practice Spanish vocabulary and grammar to do so, right? That's sort of this applied um, language component. Um, banking and stock market and marketing. So a lot of different topics. These are loosely the, the chapters, if you will, but they're not meant to follow any particular order. Uh, an instructor can, you know, reserves the right to change the order. Um, and we got feedback from students that just how much they differed in terms of how they wanted to start because they thought the job application and interview one was a great way to start because you get to know all your peers and you're interacting and you're role playing interviewer, interviewee. Um, so there was just a lot of variability and probably each semester I might do it a little bit differently, um, which is also kind of fun and exciting. Uh, and it's natural. It's not like, oh, and now we'll skip to chapter three and now we'll skip to chapter one. It, it's you just reorganize it because it's an open resource, it's very easy to do. Um, just really quickly in terms of the resource development, um, this was sort of a longer, and we're almost finished, I, I suppose I should mention, right? Like we're still in the second half of this phase, um, which is the on target, you know, but, but we're not, we're still in that second half of the fellowship. There was pre-fellowship. I, I guess it's important to note that this really is, as Diane was mentioning, this is a huge undertaking and to not have a starting point or resources already in mind or things that you've shared with colleagues, it's, it would be really difficult to just think about, I have a year to create a textbook on this topic. Um, so we were really lucky with Mina and Delia's um, past efforts to, to add to this project. Um, and then of course, all these resources didn't necessarily have a specific direction at the present moment. And so this is where we all came together in this um, really unique opportunity to, to offer this as an open resource. Um, from that point, um, and I think Diane was um, alluding to this, Ashley is a superstar project manager. I mean, it goes without saying, except for the fact that we may have a few people here who aren't familiar with Ashley, but she's just an incredible project manager. And so she offers all these templates and accountabilities and resources and, and lessons and actually offers direct support, like actually taking work. Like I never thought I would use the word sort of delegate projects throughout this um, to, to the library um, professionals, but like that is part of what happened and that was just tremendously valuable. Um, and then the second half where we're assessing, and we assessed last semester, um, the progress um, from the student's perspective in terms of relevance and impact, and I can get more into that in the Q&A or in a moment as well. Um, but, and then making it look, awesome deciding where making it look professional deciding where to actually house it um it's still sort of forthcoming um perfectly usable for us but we want it to be usable for everybody moving forward so that's where we're at now uh let, let's let's move on sorry um okay so in terms of uh the co collaboration which i've already alluded to um just the notion, and Diane did as well, the notion of professional development and consultations, and Ashley did too in the calendar. She mentioned all of the opportunities we have, some mandatory, some optional. If they're optional, we'd be silly not to attend um, type things, and we did. Um, we learned so much information in that space, whether it's about fair use evaluation or open images um, or formatting or accessibility, just so much um, information that is on our radar as as 
instructors for sure, but um, isn't always at the forefront given sort of um, time prioritization. Unfortunately, I would certainly add. Um, then the project management, um, the even the delegation of projects, for example, the image searching project was a UT Libraries um, led project um, for our resource. So um, that was real teamwork. And I feel I'm limited in my experience here, but I feel like that's unique and special. And if can be replicated, uh, really should be. It, it means a lot. Um, so we can move on. Um, challenges along the way. This is just where I'm tapping into the title expectations, milestones, division of labor. I think with expectations in a, in a textbook project, you really do want to manage the scope of it. Um, so if we, you have some resources, um, I think less will be more in terms of make, really focus on quality um, and um, knowing that you only have a limited amount of time. So um, the, the roadmaps were incredibly valuable, knowing that by this date, we would have this done. Um, and if not, then we are behind, right? Like we're, we're, we can't just have all these four or five projects, um, you know, combining with one another. Otherwise, our research duties, our conference duties, our service, our, our teaching won't give us the amount of time to really um, execute on this project. Um, communication, it's, it's interesting just because I come from industry um, and I could see that Ashley also has so many um, business and industry and cross-functional collaboration sort of skill sets that were tremendously valuable. Um, it's not easy to have like a one pager or, or an outline of each separate project with milestones laid out um, and in an easy to access way so that everyone's on the same page, you know, literally and figuratively and understands um, where we're going next and, and who's responsible for which project, breaking it down into smaller components. It's such a challenge, but to have someone on the team um, with that skill set um, is like night and day. Um, and then division of labor. Uh, this was a team, right? The author fellows was a team. So sometimes I had my own project. Sometimes Mina had her own project. Sometimes Delia had her own projects, but they had done so much work on the front end that I tried to um, do more uh, moving forward just to even come close to the amount of work and, and brilliance that they provided to the project. Uh, but some projects remained team focused. Some were cross-functional with um, UTL. And then others were delegated to, to other um, external groups. So just having those different types of projects and knowing which one's which and how to hold accountabilities and, and central um, resources for that was a tremendous learning experience. I mean, I learned a lot from this project for sure. Um, next slide, I think I'm wrapping up. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to mention that it certainly can't be taken taken for granted the, um, whether this is going well. <laughs> I mean, probably feel like we're meeting our deadlines. Um, we've created many resources in, in our past just from our profession, but is this really valuable for students or is it not? I mean, free seems good, um, but does the quality compare to competing resources is it relevant in the sense that is it used regularly? Is it aligned with the course? Does it feel forced? Um, and did it honestly have a, a positive impact in general on the learning and the achievement in class? So, so far, like really excited by the results. Uh, of course, this is just a first step, but even just to have some insights into a student in general, because things have changed since some of us were students in many ways and you know $50 or more spent on materials for any given course was just a general data point that surfaced um, many being much more than $50 um, and that almost being a, a roadblock in or cost prohibitive in the road towards actually purchasing those materials and I found that only um, students only purchase required materials for about half of their courses that that sounds crazy to me but that was what the data was saying, and I don't believe that there was any reason not to respond honestly to that. Um, and then finally, in the green was sort of more to our resources specifically. 80% um, students mentioned that free course materials would have significant or moderate impact on their ability to afford college, which is just wonderful to see that this 
really makes a difference financially for them. 98% um, of the students would access our book two to three times a week or daily. So of course, and as I'll show you in a comment from a student, it makes sense. I mean, which came first, the course or the textbook when you're developing this textbook for the course or the course around the textbook? But that's not, you can't take that for granted when you're adopting an external resource for a course that's more or less developed. Sometimes it is forced. Sometimes you're skipping half the book. And then sometimes the students even questioning, why did I pay this amount of money? So that's sort of a non-issue um, when you're creating your own resource for your own textbook. And every instructor who has access to this can do that you know, with, a, with some front end um, effort, uh, align it with their work. Um, you know, so we can just skip to the very last slide here, where I just wanted to share a few quotes that just sort of reiterate um, some of those data points. Uh, student mentioned the quality was better, specifically compared to other textbooks, because the textbook felt that it was made to complement the class, right? So we all know that experience where we are only using half the book, or you, you, you sometimes say, oh, but I don't really like this part of the book, so I'm going to do it differently, but there it is, because it's right in front of you. That was never really an issue for us. Um, I really appreciate the effort to have free class materials. Here's an interesting one, but I found it difficult to not have a physical copy of the book. So I ended up printing it out, which wasn't free. And that, I, I add that there just to mention, like this isn't sort of some sort of perfect outcome. And it's there's more thought that needs to go into this in terms of how can we continue to make this free or more affordable given different learning styles. I mean, it's an it's incredibly important topic. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it there because I know I've gone uh, far past my time. <laughs> You are all good. This is the most, uh, hearing from you and Diane is the most interesting part of this presentation. Um, though I am going to wrap up with just a little bit on what I've learned. I wanna make sure to save time for questions. So I'm gonna speak a little bit quickly. Um, but as Josh mentioned, we aren't quite done with our first full year. We're still in the middle of this, but I've already learned a lot as a coordinator that we intend to apply to future versions of the fellows program. Starting with what worked well, I am really glad that we went small for our pilot in terms of the number of participants. There was initially a little pressure to offer a few more fellowships because we had a tiny bit of budget left over, but it served us well to keep the cohort small while we figured out what works for us and what we'd want to change. And marketing the program as a pilot to applicants also helped us set ex expectations that we'd all be learning together and allowed folks who are interested in that kind of experience to self-select a little. Um, and setting expectations clearly generally was really helpful for all parties. When questions came up about deliverables or outcomes, we were almost always able to just point back to the documentation and agreements that we made to answer our questions. Um, I hope that the participants felt like they really knew what they were signing up for and felt excited about that. Along the way, I've also tried to be conscientious about documenting workflows and keeping things organized, like with the program calendar that I shared earlier. I also created templates for communications that I knew would need to be repeated each year, which has simplified life a little bit, especially as we prepare to offer this again. I've also been really happy about the interaction that we achieved in a cohort based model. Our feedback survey showed that several fellows appreciated this aspect of the program most because they got to meet new colleagues with similar interests, but different perspectives. As an example, we were fortunate to have a lawyer in our cohort, which added a really unique angle to some of our conversations, especially around copyright. Um, that specific situation can't be replicated each time, but I think each member really adds something special to the group dynamic. I also try hard, tried hard to stay flexible with my plans, especially given the pilot nature of the program. Sometimes this was small stuff like moving the programming topics around, as I mentioned earlier, but it also came up in other more service based ways. Um, Josh mentioned this example. We tried to figure out the best way to support the author team when we realized that we needed to replace some copyrighted images in their draft. We ended up using a library student workers time to locate potential replacements with openly licensed media. And while we didn't market that up front as a service for the fellows, we tried it and it seemed to work out well and it's something that we would do again. Similarly, we were fortunate to be able to engage other staff in the library and beyond on topics that were outside of my expertise, but helpful to fellows. 
Um, our assessment librarians, for example, were kind enough to offer a workshop and develop materials specifically to support our fellows, which I've included in the resources at the end of this presentation that we'll share with you. We also engaged the disability and access team to offer a workshop on developing accessible course materials, as well as those one-on-one -on -one consultations. And a member of our Center for Teaching and Learning office joined us for a discussion on developing culturally responsive course materials. And each of their expertise and guidance cumulatively really improved our experiences in this program. I think a lot of what comes next is figuring out how to thoughtfully scale the fellows program given our current cohort model and support levels with limited staff to support it. Um, even thinking about how to schedule required sessions for a group larger than the one that we had is kind of overwhelming because people have such busy schedules and teaching responsibilities. Um, and we know that our publishing support for others could be much more robust. You've seen examples of that potentially in other presentations today, um, because ours is mainly consultative and not super hands-on. But we want to be cautious about doing too much too quickly, especially since the librarians who support this program don't have prior publishing experience. Um, but that said, the majority of our applications in the first round were from interested authors. So we know that we need to find a way to scalably support, support them from both a funding and services perspective. Some of the support I'd like to be able to offer but haven't been able to do so far is related to instructional design. We're still figuring that out. That is not a centralized support offering on our campus. The other headache anyone who's attempted to offer a program like this has probably had is related to payments. <laughs> we disperse stipends that get paid directly to faculty members because that's the best way to do that here. And we do wanna pay faculty directly for their work, but it requires us to work with individual departments, HR folks, and everyone somehow seems to have a very different system for one-time payments. It's absolutely worth the work, but it has been a challenge that I like to acknowledge. Um, finally, something I'd really like to be able to do is offer programming in person. Between the pandemic and the very busy schedules of our fellows, Zoom-based meetings were the most practical way for us to go. But as you probably all experienced, the virtual environment doesn't lend itself as well to some of the discussions and activities that we'd like to do. But that's another challenge we have to balance with our desire to grow and scale the program sustainably. Schedules and locations only get harder to manage as the cohort size increases. So I just want to share one last thing. Um, <clears throat> despite some of the challenges that we encountered, we feel really proud of the outcomes in the pilot. With the $11,000 that we awarded, we expect to see over $16,000 in student savings in the first year alone, um, a figure that should grow by about the same amount each year. So that's a one and a half X ROI already and likely three X ROI by the end of next year, not to mention the likely indirect ROI, um, since most of our fellows teach more than one course and they're likely to apply what they've learned broadly over time. So we hope that these outcomes will help us build the case for sustained central funding on our campus since we funded the pilot with donor funds. So I wanna stop there because I know that we are getting close to the end of our time. I'm gonna stop screen sharing so that I can see if anyone has questions. I'm looking at the chat and I don't see anything right now, but please feel free to drop them there. Or if you'd like to speak um, out loud, you're welcome to use the hand raising feature in Zoom and I'll call on you. James, I see your hand up. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. This has been very informative and uh, so appreciative of your work. I'm James Neal from the Institute of Museum and Library Services in Washington, DC. I work uh, on managing and monitoring grants and applications related to OER. So this is a particular interest to me. I want to know about the long-term sustainability of this particular program in that you're just beginning and you're still ongoing. And perhaps I missed your comments regarding the future of the program. Thank you so much to everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, James, for attending today and for the question. In terms of sustainability for us from a funding perspective, we have already funded next year's program with a crowdfunded campaign. We call it 40 for 40 on our campus. I imagine many of you have similar crowdfunding campaigns each spring for yours. So we feel confident about uh, funding the next one to two years, but really what we're hoping to do based on the ROI that we've shown from just one year and really one semester's worth of data is acquire central funding from our university. We think that with UT's commitment to student belonging, 
equity and inclusion, we make a really clear case for students succeeding and saving money at the same time. So we really hope that our provost office will be the funder of this in the future. Any other questions? Well, we really appreciate each of you being here today. I do want to share a link to our presentation. As I mentioned, there are, oh, Sarah, I, I think that this might help. Uh, the links are in the presentation if you're interested in our templates. In particular, if you're interested in project management templates, the very last slide resources has the OEF project roadmap worksheet that is adapted from several others, including Abby Elder's project roadmap worksheet. Well, if there are no other questions, I really hope that you enjoy the remainder of this conference. I know that I absolutely am. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about the instructor learning community that Josh mentioned earlier, I will be presenting along with my co-facilitators on that tomorrow morning. So I hope to see you there if you're interested. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, so everyone. Hi, presenters, co-hosts. Let's uh, work on figuring out how to end this meeting because your host had to leave the building very quickly. So as everyone else leaves, uh, we can we can work on figuring out how to do this. Do any of you have um, maybe some way to end the recording? Um, and